David Hume, talking about personal identity. None of the background for David Hume has changed. As we saw earlier, he's an empiricist, and of course, he's still dead. So it begins with some preliminaries, looking at what other philosophers say about personal identity. He doesn't identify explicitly who he's talking about. Back in the time when Hume was Huming, you know, citing your sources, directly saying who you're talking about, was not the common practice it is today in academics. But he's probably talking about our good dead friend John Locke, also possibly Descartes, possibly also Leibniz. And so when he talks about other philosophers, he says they claim that we're always conscious of what we call our self, that we feel that it exists, we feel that it continues, and we have a certainty, you know, beyond evidence of a demonstration, sort of going back to our good dead friend Plato, we just have this rational intuition of it, of it being having this perfect identity and simplicity. So Hume, being an empiricist, decides he's going to go on an internal safari to see what he finds in himself. Because again, being an empiricist, whatever he knows has to come in through the senses or could be the internal senses. So he looks around. And part of Hume's methodology is often to say, hey, try this yourself and see what you find. So you could try this yourself and see what you find. So he, you know, introspects. And all he finds is a particular perception or another. Roughly put, a perception is like a, you know, bit of content that one finds um, when they introspect. And it could be, for example, a perception of feeling a bit of warmth or cold or, you know, a bit of an itch on your foot or light or shade or emotions like love, hatred or feelings like pain or pleasure. And so it's that bit of, well, literally perceiving things. So he claims that that's what he encounters. And further, he asserts that whenever he is perceiving, he's obviously never without a perception. And he finds nothing else. So always has a perception, never observes anything but perceptions. Now he does consider that his perceptions can be removed. When the example he uses is sleep. You know, when one is sleeping, a very sound sleep and one is not dreaming, uh, he says, as long as he is insensible of himself, he does not exist, which is a fairly radical claim. So the idea is that when he's not perceiving, he is not. Now, Hume probably didn't think that he sort of, you know, would like, you know, you'd see him fall asleep if you were there watching him and then he would blink out of existence. He thinks that his self as a person, whatever that might be, would not exist. We've already seen his view of immortality, which is there's no evidence for that. And he considers that if all his perceptions were taken away by death and he could not think, feel, see, love, or hate after his body was dissolved, uh, he would be gone forever. Hume then considers uh, you know, the matter of disagreement. And he notes that if um, someone else you know, has a different notion of themselves, Hume cannot reason with them. Why not? Well, Hume considers the possibility that another person may in fact perceive something simple and continued that they call themselves. Although in Hume's case, he's certain there is no such thing. Again, based on his empiricism, he goes and looks for it. And what he says is he doesn't find it. He just finds perceptions. He doesn't find a, sing a single continuing entity. So what's his initial theory of personal identity going to be? Well, he advocates what is now known as a bundle theory of, of persons. And a bundle theory is well, pretty much what it sounds like. A bundle is, you know, just a collection of, of things, you know, bound together. And so this, um, this bundle view is that in this case, there's got to be like, what's the bundle made up of? And also the question of what kind of bundles things together. So for him, 
A person is only a bundle or collection of different perceptions. So what makes up a person for him would be all these perceptions. And the image there is of the bubbles, because uh, that's always the metaphor I like use for Hume's bundle theory. Imagine, you know, a bunch of a bunch of soap bubbles, you know, f floating, and you know, sort of all touching each other. And each each bubble is like a perception. And so the whole collection of bubbles in this metaphor would be the person. And I also choose the metaphor of the bubbles because if you're familiar with with soap bubbles, you know, they pop and then other ones form and they pop and they form. And as Hume notes, perceptions replace each other. They're in perpetual flux and movement. And so the sort of popping and forming soap bubbles provides a pretty good metaphor for what Hume seems to be describing. And he claims there's no power in of the soul. And he's referring to the soul, not really claiming that there is such a thing. But he's saying that, you know, because he doesn't really have a great term for this thing. So it'd be better to say that the bundle never remains the same, even for a moment. So you can think of, of the self as a bundle of bubbles, popping and forming, popping and forming, never staying the same, at least on his view. And that's kind of the metaphor that I use. Now, then he turns to a analogy or metaphor of his own, that of the theater. So Hume says, the mind is a kind of theater where these perceptions appear on, you know, stage. And he kind of presents his metaphor and analogy and then seems to a sort of mid-analogy mid realize, hmm, this is not that great. So what does he then say? Well, he says there's no simplicity at one time, so it's, you know, complicated. There's no identity in different times, so it's a complicated thing, you know, complex. And it's not identical across time, but we do imagine otherwise. As Hume said, we kind of feel that there is a simple singular self and that it has identity across time. But he denies that. And so he then, as soon as he brings up his analogy, he kind of abandons it and says this comparison to a theater, you know, even though he makes it, he says, oh, don't be misled by this. Because as he says, what is the mind? For him, it's only these perceptions. And he says, we have no notion of the place where these scenes are represented or the materials composing it. So he says, the mind is kind of a theater, but actually, no, not at, not at all. So he kind of brings up the metaphor to dispose of it. Now Hume says that we ascribe identity to these perceptions as they succeed each other. That is, going back to my bubble metaphor, the idea is that we say, you know, that the bubble, the bundle, bumble, <laughs> the bundle of, bun of bubbles keeps on being exactly the same thing, having an identity, the same thing across time. So Hume is in a way kind of doing psychology here. He's wondering, so why, even though it seems like this bundle of perceptions is constantly changing, there's no simplicity, there's no identity, why do we think that it has a uninterrupted existence, an identity across time? Now, Hume does this quite often when he talks about, um, if you take the epistemology class, for example, and he talks about, you know, knowledge of the external external world, he quickly just sets aside the question of knowing if there are objects or not and just says, the question to ask is, why do we think there are objects? So it's kind of like to use an analogy. I always use the analogy of the monster in the closet. If a child is talking about a monster in the closet, the parents and others would not say, hmm, I wonder what sort of monster this is. We need to look this up on the internet and then find a way to kill it. Well, no, what they, what they ask is not, you know, what is the monster? But they ask, why does the kid think there's a monster? Because it's kind of an assumption there is no monster. So what Hume's doing here is saying, why do we think this? And his underlying assumption is, we're thinking about something that's not real. We think there's this identity, but there's not. Just like the the child may think there's a monster in their closet, but there's not. So the question is not, 
what type of monster is it but why does a kid think there's a monster there so why doesn't hume think there's anything there well he claims that every distinct perception that contributes to forming the mind has a distinct existence and what we do is we suppose that these perceptions you know the bubbles popping and forming popping and forming are somehow united by identity and the reason why i have the picture of the um, you know necklace there is we we think you know think of like each of those beads on the necklace is a single moment in, in time, like one bundle. And we think there's something that is uniting these. And so in my necklace metaphor, each little bead is, you know, that bundle at that moment in time, the smallest moment of time possible. And the thread is what is supposed to tie them all together. But according to, to Hume, we never see the threat the understanding never observes a real connection why not well i mentioned hume's view of cause and effect uh, before and we'll say more about this in a bit but he claims that cause and effect our notion of that is habituation roughly put you can think of an analogy to the story of pavlov's dog at least how it's presented the idea with pavlov's dog is again according to the story he rings a bell gives the dog a treat rings a bell gives the dog a treat and eventually the dog starts you know salivating after the bell is rung even though there's no connection between the bell and the treat the bell doesn't cause the treat and so for hume once we see something happen over and over and over and over again we're like that dog we become conditioned to associate one thing followed by another so in the case of this alleged identity we we never see that so we don't see the the threat because according to Hume as we'll see there is no threat so why do we think there's an identity there why do we think that all these bundles are you know threaded together forming identity across time well his claim is we attribute them due to the connection of their these ideas in our imagination so essentially it's the answer is imagination we're imagining a connection that's not there. Now, when it comes to relations, in terms of like what might be potentially connecting these, these bundles of bubbles, Hume claims the only qualities that can yield an idea of union in the imagination, because again, he says we're essentially imagining this, would be resemblance, things, you know, seeming to be alike contiguity which is essentially proximity in space and or time and causation and he claims that these are the three uniting principles and without them every distinct object can be separated by the mind and appears to have no connection with any other object so if we took away resemblance contiguity and causation there'd be no connection between things now for him in this case um contiguity doesn't you know proximity in space doesn't fit in so he takes identity to depend on resemblance and causation so essentially what he's doing is in a way like a psychological analysis he's saying again not what is there but why do we think there's a connection between these unconnected you know bubbles and bundles well resemblance and causation is the answer he says essentially what happens is because of resemblance and causation we get this easy transition of ideas um, and we have this due to our progression of thoughts along a train of connected ideas they you know you're thinking about something and you can sort of tie back your thought to the previous one the previous one the previous one and then we sort of because of the resemblance and also the causation as we'll see we then think that there's identity there that there is something that is staying identical throughout time so how is this working well Hume says a bit more about this we do this through our memory so for him 
memory is a faculty which we use to raise up images of past perceptions. And what he thinks we do is, if we frequently place resembling perceptions in a chain of thought, this leads our imagination to link them together. And this makes the whole seem like a continuing object. So you, to use a you know, easy example, if you look to one side of the room and then look all the way across the other side, you remember, you know, back and, and you reflect back on what you saw before, you kind of have this resemblance because each, each section you're kind of looking at, think of them as slides of a movie, each one is different, but each one resembles the one before it, as you know, as your eyes are metaphorically in the movie, the camera pans across. And so because of the resemblance, it makes its feel, it makes your imagination think these are all connected together and there's one thing here. There's one continuing identity, namely you doing that perceiving. So he claims that memory discovers identity and contributes to its production. That is to say, it gives us the resemblance. You remember your past uh, perceptions, so you can compare a current perception to your past perceptions and compare them to each other. And then your imagination, according to Hume, leads you to accepting that there's identity there, that there is a you that continues and there's identity across time. But again, this is for Hume, a psychological analysis. So that's the resemblance bit. What about the causation bit? Well, he brings up another analogy. And generally, philosophers cannot resist analogies. So he says, okay, what's the mind going to be? And laying out some metaphysics here, he says, the mind is going to be a system of these different perceptions. What connects them? Well, he says, cause and effect that produces, destroys, influences, and modifies uh, these perceptions. And we get an imp impression, you know, that an experience. This creates ideas. These ideas produce other impressions. So we have this ongoing process. Again, you can use my metaphor of, you know, of, of these bubbles forming and popping, forming and popping. Now, his analogy here is that the soul, and again, he's not He's using the term, but he's not saying there is a soul. He says it's like a republic or a commonwealth. How so? Well, think of the United States. Depending on how you date the origin of the United States, you know, 1776, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence, or 1789, the you know, the Constitution. The United States has been around for a couple hundred years. But obviously we don't have the same laws. We don't have the same people, we don't have the same land, but we say this, you know, the country is, you know, a certain age. Why? Well, we say that because there is a causal connection, you know, across time. So, you know, things change, but they're, they're linked by this causal connection. So the um, colonies of 1776, give way to the United States of 1789, which gives way to the United States of 1980, then, you know, 2019, 2020, and there are causal connections. And so by analogy, the same with a person, they can vary their character, disposition, impressions, ideas, and still retain their identity because they're connected by causation. So here Hume seems to be presenting an actual metaphysical theory. What is the self? What are you? What am I? Well, we're a bundle of perceptions linked by causation. And so the causation seems to be kind of like the thread, although it's not a thing, but there seems to be a connection there. 